Hi, I'm Christopher Annadale. I've tracked down some of my former students to ask, is there life after philosophy? Welcome to Life After Philosophy. Our guest today is Brian Fink. Brian is a 2010 graduate of Mount St. Mary's University with a master's degree in philosophy. He is currently a homesteader and teacher at a Catholic liberal arts school in Michigan. Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Dr. Annadale. It's great to be on. I thought we might start by just talking about what you're doing today, what your life is like in the, I guess now 13 years since you graduated, and then maybe with a brief look back at your study of philosophy and what it's meant to you and what it looks to like, to, like to you from present day perspective. Why don't you go ahead? Sure. It's hard to believe it's been 13 years since I earned that degree at Mount St. Mary's. Uh, since that time, uh, I discerned uh, during that time, uh, I was studying to, to become a priest for the Diocese of Peoria, but discerned uh, later on that I was not called to the priesthood. And uh, shortly after I left the seminary. I was uh, married in 2014, and here in 2023, uh, my wife and I are blessed with five children. Our oldest is a little girl, and then we've got four boys in a row, so uh, we've slowly lost our minds with each uh, subsequent child. Uh, after uh, leaving the seminary, I began teaching at a high school in, in here in, in central Michigan. It was the degree that I earned originally before entering the seminary. I taught four years at uh, the local Catholic high school and then shifted to middle school, uh, which is always an interesting thing to say and uh, sometimes complicated to explain. But I now teach religion and history at a, a small parochial school in Lansing. And uh, our school over the last five or six years has moved more and more toward a a liberal arts approach or, or a liberal arts model, which means a whole lot of things to a whole lot of people. And uh, we can perhaps discuss that a bit. But this is now wrapping up my sixth year as uh, a middle school religion and history teacher. Uh, and in the meantime, as, you, as you'd mentioned, Chris, we live on a homestead and we have livestock. We have milk goats, dairy goats, and, and chickens. We've got pigs, uh, some barn cats, uh, and a, a massive garden and a pear tree and all that sort of thing too. So we're, we're, we're living out that kind of simple life uh, as, as best we can in the midst of a kind of crazy modern world. So that's my yeah, background I, in a nutshell. I, I think of you as my, my goat farmer friend. That, that's <laughs> the kind of mental space, mental that's, tag that I have on you. I, I think it makes sense because there are very few of us. I mean, we, we, we're legion, but we, you just don't see us around very often and, and you don't hear about us a whole lot, especially in the United States. Um, people are raising all sorts of other animals and, and less so um, dairy goats. But it was something that I actually inherited from my dad's parents. They started the farm from as long as ago as I can recall, uh, they lived on a farm uh, my whole time growing up. And after, after they went to God, I just sort of felt a desire in my heart to carry it on. And now it's hard to imagine living any other way. Oh, that's fantastic. I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that's, that's working out so well. Yeah. Let, let, let me ask you this. Uh, one of the ideas I had in starting this podcast was to try to answer the question that, that some people have is, you know, what, what do you do with that? You say, I mean, I'm studying philosophy and people think, well, you could teach philosophy to other people who are interested in studying philosophy the way you are, mm -hmm. but what, what else could you conceivably do? So looking at this from a perspective of, you know, almost a decade and a half, uh, what, what, how, how has philosophy shaped the, the kind of life you've lived since then and the kind of thing you're doing now and in the future? Well, it's interesting because you, you sent me a few questions to think about and uh, beforehand, which I'm grateful for. And I found myself trying to respond to the kinds of questions that students ask about the liberal arts in general, but philosophy perhaps chief among them. What am I going to do with this? And as, as I considered the answer, it, it's Philosophy itself, the study of philosophy, the opportunity that I had to study philosophy through the, the whole undergraduate program, beginning with ancient philosophy and, and ending with 
uh, with courses from, from metaphysics to the study of St. Thomas and, and everything in between, what I discovered is that it's the wrong question to ask. And it's because of philosophy, my study of philosophy, that I, in one sense, felt like I was able to fairly easy, excuse me, fairly easily come to that answer. It's not the right question to ask, what can I do with this? Because philosophy, forgive me, professor, but it's useless in the modern utilitarian sense. It's useless. Sure, you could be a philosophy professor. You could try to write books on philosophy. You could perhaps get yourself plugged into some kind of think tank and, and uh, that, that wants uh, a bit of esoteric uh, kind of input. But if you're looking at it as a path to financial success uh, or status, you're, you're beginning with the wrong approach. You might as well raise goats. That's right. Exactly right. Because there's not a whole lot of money in that either. But precisely because it's useless, because you, because when you think about it, you don't think about it as what can I get out of this? I have found without question that my study of philosophy has shaped every aspect of my life. Everything that I do, everything that I think about, the way that I think about things, the choices that I make, everything has been influenced by my study of philosophy. And that sounds super great to add to a fancy podcast on life after philosophy, but it's true. Yeah, It's true. In a fundamental way, my study of philosophy reshaped the way I think, the way I think about life. And not in the sense that, you know, I'm really good at debating people or that I sound smart because I can, I can say, well, Aristotle would say, or Plato would say, but because it has given me a framework to think about the whole of existence. And as a human being, the way that we flourish is by living an integrated life. And so everything that we do, insofar as it connects in an integrated way to everything else that we do, that's the path to human flourishing. And so the, the foundation that I had in philosophy, the framework of philosophy, gives me that. It, it provided that for me in a way that I don't know that, that you can get it any other way. I mean, I think... Uh, a, a traditional liberal arts degree will get you there as well because they're taking a holistic approach to education as well. The, educating the whole person uh, is, a, is a fancy buzz phrase that's often used, right. but specifically philosophy. And, and of course, in my, in my application, if you want to call it applied philosophy, I, I use philosophy every day in my parenting. I use it every day in my teaching. And because I, I teach at a, a liberal arts school, what I, the beautiful thing about having studied philosophy is that I'm now, as a teacher in the liberal arts tradition, preparing them for that. And that's a beautiful thing that yeah. we're you know, going through the, the grammar and the dialectic and the rhetoric in preparation for the synthesis of those things uh, after the quadrivium in philosophical studies with an aim, of course, to the study of theology, right? So... I, the, 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 that's the long answer, but the short answer is I use philosophy every single day, not in a self-reflective way, but because it's shaped who I am as a human being and how I think for sure, without, without question. That's a fantastic answer. Thanks, Brian. Sure. Let, let me yeah. ask you this in, in, in part of what you've said, it sounds like there's, 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 at least two elements there. There is this mm. element of, you might say, giving up the world, of, of retreating from the world, of admitting this is useless, I'm going to dedicate my life, or, or you know, see the world through this frame of its uselessness. I'm going to retreat from the, the calculus of utility that drives a lot of people's approach to education. And one might even associate that with a religious vocation, right? Okay, this is the kind of thing that a priest or a monk would need at a very fundamental level. It's a way of sort of detaching from the world, the things of the world, the, the priorities of the world. But 
as as your answer developed, you went on to then to talk about integration and 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 in sense passing passing this on to another generation of students. And it sounds like that there is this way, perhaps dialectically, in which you've come back to, you know, ap appropriating the world in in a new way of approaching the world in in a new way with a new fuller sense of self, an integrated sense of self, a greater kind of self possession, if I may. Yeah, that, yeah. that comes through the study of philosophy. Is there something going on like that? A kind of losing the world in order to gain the world. Right. Uh, yeah. No, I think that's a great that's a great observation, Chris. One thing I wrote down. Uh, thinking about the question of the influence that it's had, I wrote things down like, uh, as a parent, it helps. I, I think it helps me as a parent help my children think through their thoughts. And I, you know, I'll, 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 I'll forever remember the kind of definition that Aristotle, I believe, it's been 13 years, gives of God, which is thinking, 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 or thought, thinking, thinking. And what I tell my students all the time, when they the buzzword in education is critical thinking, and nobody really knows what that means, but I think it means thinking about what you're thinking about, and as that that has come from philosophy without a doubt. So, as a parent and as a teacher, helping my students and my children think through their thoughts, connecting the parts of their lives and the parts of their existence to the whole, and seeing how the whole is, is the, summative, um, the, the summative aspect of the parts. I wrote about integration, but then to answer your question more directly, Chris, I wrote down that for me personally, and I hope for my students and, and for my kids, it gives me some freedom. I, that's, the wrote, that's, that's the word I wrote down. I find that I am free from all sorts of isms, all sorts of trends. I'm free from emotivism and being driven by my feelings. And I recognize when I'm being driven by my feelings. These are my feelings. This is not, this is not reason at work. I'm free from that. And the beauty of being free from that in a kind of detached way is not I'm detached from my feelings. No, I just cried the other night at eighth grade graduation talking about these kids who drive me crazy. Uh, it's not that I'm free from that, but I'm, I'm free in a detached way so that I can see when my children and my students are being driven by their emotions. And I'll say, pause, let's just pause. What are you thinking right now? Nothing. It's pure emotion. And you see that everywhere in the world more and more. I'm free from scientism and the savior of technology. I'm free from that because I know that all of us will die sooner than later. And that perspective has come from philosophy. It's come from seeing reality, I think, hopefully more and more as it is, which I think is the goal of philosophy. The, the, at the, the end goal, if there is a goal, if there is an aim, it's love and it's seeing reality as it is and, and incorporating one's life, if you want to apply it, incorporating one, one's life to reality, conforming one's life to reality. So freedom was, it was a big word that kept coming back uh, as an answer to the question of what it's done effectively in my life, for sure. No, that, that, that's fantastic. Thank you again. Uh, I, I wonder, I, I love this expression that you were using before. I, I think you talked about applied philosophy. Yeah. In the sense that we, you might think of philosophy as being this very abstract classroom, uh, very word focused, um, language focused thing, right? I'm going to write a paper of this many words. I'm going to sure. analyze this concept of freedom and expose its conceptual structure or different ways of, of, of discussing and appropriating freedom. But we're on, we live in the world, not in the classroom. And so you've got this real world experience as a homesteader, yeah. as a husband, as a father, as a teacher. As, as someone who's trying to, to shape other people as, as a sort of liver out of your own freedom, mm. as well as a kind of bearer and, and transmitter of a certain kind of freedom to other people, mm. a, a freedom that, that has this kind of ironical, you know, almost Socratic um, aspect of, of beginning by giving up all, all the freedom that, that the world and financial success seems to, seems to offer. Right. You have any thoughts about any specific uh, occasions on which uh, just something has lit up your mind 
about, you know, here, here's where my philosophy education has changed me. Here's why I would have reacted differently in this situation if I hadn't had this kind of background study of philosophy, or is maybe instead this been something that's, that's just simply more pervasive, uh, uh, affecting your entire worldview? Well, I mean, in a sense, as I mentioned, I think earlier, the it's, it's influenced, it's influenced everything. And perhaps in specific ways, I, you know, I mentioned this this idea of seeing when the people around me, usually my kids, but I mean, come on, they're little. Most children, most humans are driven by their emotions. But you give you give kids a little slack because they're still being formed, their reason is still being developed. But to see when they're being driven by that, and my students too, and my colleagues, and that that's a that's a, a fascinating thing. Another thing that I wrote down if you want to use the term applied philosophy, at the end of the day, no matter what field of study one pursues and subsequently what career path one takes, at the end of the day, the existence of life is about relationships and you will have relationships no matter what path you go into. Even if you think that you're going to be a, be some kind of YouTube influencer and 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 live in a studio apartment and you're still gonna have to go to the grocery store. You're still gonna have to, to to meet people at family gatherings. You're still going to have to encounter people uh, on the subway or on the train or at the airport. You're still gonna sit down at restaurants. And in, in the most fundamental sense, hopefully, you're still going to seek out and pursue a spouse. And for the vast majority of people, you're going to get married and you're going to have children. And you're going to have friends who are the parents of your kids' friends and navigating relationships, whether in the, the business world, whether in your career field or in your personal life, the, the foundational understanding that I've, I think, appropriated from my study of philosophy is, I hope, made me a better friend, made me a better dad made me a better husband because as I said earlier, even though I'm not good at it all the time, I recognize that the aim, well, aim is heaven, but in this life, it's a kind of integration. It's the integration of my thoughts, my feelings, and my actions. And Perhaps you get there, like I said, perhaps you get there some other way through lived experience, through wisdom. I, I think, you know, the the old farmers out, uh, you know, uh, on their on their plows in the, in the olden days, the the families working on their their little cottage industry businesses, uh, the the smaller, slower way of life. Perhaps philosophy was integrated without it ever having been said or taught, and it wasn't necessarily the case that that these, these folks were, were studying philosophy. But, but I remember Anthony Esselin in one of his books talking about remembering this old time farmer that he knew as a kid in Pennsylvania who would recite canto after canto of Dante's Divine Comedy from memory. Now, was he doing philosophy? Well, call it what you want. I mean, yeah, sure, it was, it was an epic, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an ancient epic poem. Uh, it's literature. I mean, you can categorize it however you want, but it was this farmer living the good life, right? Which is a kind of liberal arts phrase that, that the aim is to live a good life or to live life well. But at the at the peak of just below just below theology, in the liberal arts tradition, is a study of philosophy, and so you're aiming toward that. And some you know the ancients never got past that because of their understanding of the afterlife and of of the divine. They didn't have the benefit of the incarnation, but, but I see that as a parent, as a teacher in my own life, that all of the things that I do, what I buy, what I don't buy, the movies I watch, the books I read, still to this day, I, I'm still reading philosophy or I'm not digging into, you know, the critique of pure reason anymore, but philosophy is still the most interesting thing to read. It's still the most rewarding thing to read, even if it's even if it's a kind of step away from or step uh, beyond a layer beyond maybe the original sources. So thinkers like uh, Anthony Eslin, uh, thinkers like, I just read this 
amazing article yesterday, or it was a speech that I, Paul Kingsnorth gave uh, about, is there anything left to conserve? And he thought, you think he's going to make a political speech, but no, he's, he's just talking about philosophical principles. I read Joseph Pieper every chance I get because it's the most rewarding and enriching thing. It's so much better than scrolling through Instagram or watching yeah. cat videos on YouTube, you know? So I, th um, I think, I think yeah. I did a, I think I did a YouTube series on a work by Joseph Pieper, I think in part inspired by some things you had said a, yeah. a year or two ago. He, he's fantastic. Yeah. Of course. He's, Go yeah. ahead, please. So, I mean, specific instances, you know, am I teaching my students philosophy? Well, we, 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 we definitely talk about arguments and argumentative fallacies for sure. And I, we work that in a practical way. Let's look at this argument. Let's listen to these people arguing and let's see the flaws we can find. And that's, that's so helpful because more than just, ha ha, I pointed out this fallacy to you. Look how smart I am. More than that, it's me being able to think through the flaws in my own arguments and being able then to say the true thing when I speak, not, not an argument based on some fallacious way of, of, of presenting the argument or the appeal, you know, the, the appeal to, to authority or ad hominem, that's everybody's favorite, especially on Twitter and in politics. Oh, yes. But the, I think I'll go back to that, to the, to the word freedom. It has freed me, I think, to be more and more what a human being is and is for. That's wonderful. Thank you, Brian. I, I think in my mind, one of the big takeaways from this conversation has been this idea of integration, of living an integrated life. And as you're speaking, as I'm thinking of you teaching your middle schoolers, I, I'm thinking of different cultural critiques that have been raised about the, the kind of anxiety that some of the younger generation, the millennials, and now the, the Zoomers, they're called what, Generation Z, are feeling, a, a feeling that, that life is kind of fragmented and disconnected. There are no authority structures to follow. There's no clear path forward. There's no clear way of discerning a path forward. And the kind of things you're talking about, the, the integration that comes through the study of philosophy, the self-possession, that's my word, and then the freedom, which you've talked about repeatedly, mm -hmm. that seems to me to be an, an important target and an important sort of future a life goal that people might take in mind if somebody's asking me a year from now, what's what's the benefit of a philosophy education? Yeah. I might say it's 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 freedom, it's integration, it's self knowledge. But these are the kinds of things you can't achieve directly in a utilitarian way by saying that I'm, I'm going to major in self knowledge. I'm going to become free by deliberately trying to become free. Right. There is this way of 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 recalibrating your entire framework for approaching the world. Mm -hmm. by by engaging in this philosophical study in the in this deep sort of way absolutely absolutely and you know exactly what you said about about the disconnected sense of existence that that so many young people have and when the structures have been torn down around us and they are increasingly so you you're left feeling as though there's nothing to cling to and, and in part, one of the things that I try to help my students understand, you know, my, the vast majority of my students, they're great families, you know, faithful families. And I can't, uh, it's hard to imagine what life is like, let's say in, in your average Midwestern public school across a spectrum of, let's say, socioeconomic factors. But one of the things that I'm noticing more and more in my students is they have a sense of, they might have a sense of anxiety or a sense of, of kind of aimlessness, but they're not quite sure even what to think about that, mm -hmm. right? They're, they, they know it's there and they know in a sense that they should do something about it or that it shouldn't be like that, but they're just... The, and maybe not even, it's not even that they're not sure what to think about it. It's that they don't think about it. They're so easily, all of us, and I, I always say this to my students, whenever I say, you all, you're on your phones too much. All of us, all of us are on our phones too much. All of us are easily uh, satiated. It's a kind of tranquilizer, that, isn't it? That's right. By that little dopamine drip from the notification update and the, and the, the infinite scroll. Uh, kids are especially susceptible because obviously their brains are still developing and that's who the, 
the apps and the developers are targeting. Mm -hmm. But the, the hard thing I find for them isn't, isn't so much thinking hard things, it's thinking at all rather than just acting or reacting, kind of bouncing around. And that's, that's the sense that, that I get from not all of my students, but some that I know are really online. They're just bouncing around, just bouncing around, reacting to things. And the, the effect of that, obviously, is, is the anxiety, is the sense of, uns, uh, of being unsettled, of being undirected. And of course, the, you know, at the heart of, of philosophical study is a teleology, a directing, a directing towards something. And um, if I can help reintroduce that or introduce that in a, in a primary way to the students, that one of the ways you find a bit of foundation, the one, you, one of the ways you, you get a, a, a grip on that, the side of that boulder is by stopping, pausing, and thinking about what you're thinking about. And so if, if a young undergraduate ever imagines having children, and let's say they're 18 or 19 now, and let's say they start having kids 10 years from now in their late 20s, it's going to be 10 times worse 10 years from now. Yeah. And so the, the, the primary refuge for their children is going to be their home. And so they got to get their act together. They, they, they got to get some things figured out on their own. And this, it's a great antidote. Philosophy is a great antidote to, to the modern malaise. It's a, it's, a, it's a weapon to fight back against it. And it sounds so strange because it just seems like a, all you do is sit in libraries and read tall stacks of books. But mm -hmm. the, the application of it is real and powerful and in real time, for sure, for sure. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Brian, for the conversation today. This is great. This is my, my guest has been Brian Fink, goat farmer, father, husband, educator, and philosopher. Thank you again, Brian, for being on the show. I'm really, really grateful. Thank you very much, Chris, for, for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Life After Philosophy. If you enjoyed the podcast, please rate it five stars and share this episode with a friend. I appreciate your support.